And as I was introduced, I think I heard in that introduction, did, did someone say I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick? Trying to imagine what my connection is to Douglas and Washington. It's like trying to picture what a billion dollars looks like with all of those zeros. But many people know a grandparent, and some of you may have even known a great grandparent. And that's how close I feel to both of my ancestors. Because you see, my great grandmother, Fanny Douglas, to whom I was very close, she lived to be 103 years old. Mm. She met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. She didn't know that she was going to grow up and marry his grandson, but that's what happened. And my Aunt Portia, to whom I was also very close, lived to be 95. And she was Booker T. Washington's daughter. And several years ago, I was with a group of sixth graders. And they were all looking at me almost cross-eyed, like, man, you are so far removed. And what does all of this ancient history have to do with my life today? And so I was trying to come up with a way to get them to understand how close I am in the generations, and I had this thought that hands, it actually touched the great Frederick Douglass, and hands, it touched the great Booker T. Washington, also touched mine. So in a sense, even with all of those greats, I could say I stand just one person away from history. I stand one person away from each man, and I stand one person away from slavery. And when you consider the generations of families, we're not that far removed from the history of slavery. And I've had the honor and privilege over the past 11 years that we've been doing work with the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives and interacting and engaging with tens of thousands of young people around the country to really talk to them about this history because our young people, it's been my experience, they don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. But it's not their fault. I understand after coming out of hundreds of years of oppression and slavery, and the trauma, and how there was no plan for emancipation. We had four million enslaved people of African descent that were just set free with no plan. There was no counseling. There was no post-traumatic stress disorder syndrome designation. They had been separated from their families. They spent the first couple of years just looking, trying to reconnect with their families. Most did not know how to read and write because as we know, it was illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. So I understand after coming out of all of that trauma, why these stories were not passed down. And so what we hope to do in our organization, what I hope to do tonight, is really talk about this history and I hope that it's gonna come alive for you. Because I'm gonna tell you about two men that were born into slavery. They were born into the most horrific conditions that a human being could be subjected to, but yet through the power of education, and you heard it tonight in that brilliant spoken word, by Gregory and the beautiful music. Let's give everybody a hand for the music and spoken words. Both of my ancestors understood from a very young age that education would be their pathway to freedom. And they would have to steal their education. Now later in life, when people saw Frederick Douglass and they saw this white-haired statesman who was the first African-American nominated for Vice President of the United States, first African-American U.S. Marshal, first African-American Recorder of Deeds in the District of Columbia, first African-American Ambassador and Council General in Haiti, first African-American to have a statue dedicated in his honor, and the list goes on and on and on, and people would say, Frederick, I need to know, where'd you go to school? Where did you get your education? And having never spent one day of his life in a classroom, he would respond on, on occasion by saying, my degree is written on my back. Mm. My Lord, my Lord. So I'm going to tell you about two men that were born into slavery, but in spite of that, through education, they were able to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles to rise up, to affect change, to affect positive change in the lives of millions of people. And they've really set the groundwork along with many other heroes and heroines. You're related to Frederick Douglass and to Booker T. Washington? Well, what do you do? <laughs> and they always follow that up with, and it better be good. <laughs> so there's been a little bit of pressure trying to live up to the legacies of these two great American heroes. And the other question that I get is, Douglas and Washington weren't related to each other. How is it you related to both of them? Anybody wondering that? No. Okay. Well, here's how it happened. 
It happened on my mother's side of the family. My grandfather, Frederick Douglass III, my mother's father, his name was Frederick Douglass III. He was a surgeon, and he was Frederick Douglass's great-grandson. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, Nettie Hancock Washington, was Booker T. Washington's granddaughter. And my grandparents met in 1941 at Tuskegee Normal Schooling Institute, which is the school that Booker T. Washington founded in 1881. They happened to be on campus the same day, which was really kind of an interesting thing because my grandmother was born in Tuskegee, but she was living in California at the time. She was just home for summer vacation. And my grandfather, as I said, was a surgeon, and he'd been commissioned down there by the Veterans Administration during World War II. So they just happened to be on campus the same day. They were rushing across to get to the other side and literally bumped into each other. Didn't know that the other descended from an historic family. And they fell in love at first sight and wound up getting married just three months later. Wow. Yeah, wow is right. Yeah. Now, as the father of two daughters, I don't recommend for any of you young people that are in here that you get married after knowing somebody only three months. Yeah, days anyway. There was anywhere. a plan in place to bring these two historic families together. So my mother, Nettie Washington Douglas, who lives in Atlanta, is the first person to unite the bloodlines of the families. My mother was an only child, so I have the honor and privilege and blessing to be the first male to carry the dual lineage. So that's how the families collided, as we like to say, in our family. So Frederick Douglass, he was born Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. He was born on the Eastern Shore of Maryland to an enslaved woman and to a white man and it was presumed that his master was his father. He never had a pair of pants or shoes until he was around seven years old. He used to sleep head first in an old corn sack on cold winter nights with his feet hanging out on a muddy, damp floor because that was the only way he could try and keep himself warm. He only saw his mother a handful of times his whole life and that's because she lived on a plantation that was 12 miles away. So in order for her to see her son, she would have to work in the fields picking cotton from sun up to sundown, from sea to can't see, and then she would walk 12 miles in the middle of the night and, gen and spend just a few precious moments with him. He was about a year old at the time, mm. and she would stay with him until he would fall asleep, and then she would have to walk 12 miles back so she could be back on the plantation by the time the sun came up, because if she wasn't, she was most likely going to face a brutal beating. My Lord. But he did have someone early in his life that showed him some love and nurturing, and that was his grandmother, Betsy. Her job on the plantation was to raise the master's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and to raise the enslaved children until they were old enough to really begin their life in manual labor. And on this plantation, that was around five or six years old. And you'll notice when I talk about Frederick's age, I'll say five or six or seven or eight, and that's because he didn't know how old he was. There were no birth certificates for enslaved people. And he actually would guess the year of his birth, and he pointed it close to 1817. But after he passed away, there was some information that was uncovered by historians that placed it closer to 1818. So this year, 2018, we celebrate his bicentennial which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. So I say five or six because again, we don't really know how old he was, but at that age, his grandmother came to him and said, Frederick, we're going to go on a long journey. And that journey is a 12 mile walk to the main plantation called White House. Now, can you imagine this little boy who didn't know who his father was, had only seen his mother a few times in his life, and now the only person that showed him some love is taking him on this journey. And of course, she's very nervous because she had done this many times before, but this was the first time she'd ever taken this journey with her own blood, with her own kin. Stories to young people. We want them to look at these great heroes and heroines from history as living people that actually overcame obstacles and challenges because it becomes a tangible example to them that no matter what they're facing in their lives, and no matter what you all are facing in your lives, we can see that if humans have done it, humans can do it. And so at the age of eight or nine years old, Frederick Cap, when he wrote in his first autobiography, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, which was published in 1845, in that book he wrote, 
I was only so hungry as a slave child. I always had this pit of hunger in my stomach that would never go away. And when he was at eight, he had what he called divine providence in his favor happen. And that was he was chosen from among all of the children on the plantation to go to Baltimore to be the house servant of his master's brother. His name was Hugh All. Now the importance of this move was he was leaving in an environment where he wasn't around people that could help him to learn to read and write, and he was going to the big city. He would be around three black children that knew how to read and write. He would be around four white children. But what happened most importantly when he got there was his slave mistress, Sophia All, had never had a slave before. And she was just a kind Christian lady that saw this little bright boy, and she began to teach young Frederick his ABCs. And all he needed was that little spark of light, of knowledge into his mental darkness. Again, this is another message that is as relevant today when we talk about mental bondage and trying to free your mind from mental slavery. And so she teaches him. But when his master finds out, you know what happened? He got angry. And he looked at his wife and he looked at young Frederick and he said, you cannot teach a slave how to read and write because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. Did you all hear that? I think I heard it in the spoken word too. Amen. His master said, you cannot teach him how to read and write because if you do, it will unfit him to be a slave. And so Frederick looked at his master and he thought, hmm, if you don't want me to have this, I'm gonna do everything in my power to gain. Yes. And he understood right then and there that knowledge is power and education would be his pathway to freedom. Yes. And so he begins to teach himself to read and write. And he was very clever in the way that he was able to do that. Now, remember, he's in the big city, so he's able to interact with the children in the city. So he would pick up a stick off the ground and he would draw on the dirt. Awesome. And he would say, Susie, is this, how you, is this how you write an S? So he would scratch it on the wall. And she would say, no, Freddie B, this is how you write an S. <laughs> and he would file it away and take that information with him and he would build on it. He would always carry in his pocket bread. And he would trade bread with the poor kids for reading lessons. A moment ago I said that he wrote in his autobiography, I was always so hungry as a slave child that I always had this pit of hunger in my stomach that would never go away. And on occasion, when I would get food, the overseer would take cornmeal mush, throw it into a pig trough, and all the children, including Frederick, would crawl on their hands and knees as fast as they could to eat what little food was in there. To eat like pigs. To eat like animals, because that's what he was considered. He was property. He was no better than the cattle, the sheep, the horses, the pigs. So now if you think about this idea of this little boy that would trade bread, he would trade food, something of such great importance and value to him for reading lessons. Again, what does that say about the power of knowledge and education that he would rather, what, feed his mind, mind and have his stomach go empty? <laughs> My Lord. So what his master predicted happened is he's starting to grow and he's breaking the chains of mental bondage. He's becoming unfit. His master said he would also be running away with himself <laughs> if he had the knowledge. He became unfit and unruly. So he was sent to a slave breaker by the name of Edward Covey. And Covey's job was to break slaves, to break them to the level of a brute, to an animal. And Douglas was hired out to Covey for a year. And when he got there, Covey would whip him. And then he would start to whip him again. And then the beatings would become more frequent as he saw that he wasn't breaking Frederick. Also in that autobiography, he wrote, the slavery was so brutal to me, the pen with which I'm putting these words down to paper, I could rest in the cracks and fissures of my feet that have never closed shut. My Lord. And as Covey would whip him, he'd whip him so bad the welts on his back wouldn't have a chance to heal. And after six months of taking these brutal beatings, Frederick said, I was almost reduced to the level of a brood. But there was something inside of him, there was a spirit inside of him that rose up and he decided to fight back. We know Frederick Douglass without Anna Murray Douglass. She was the first person in her family to be born free in Baltimore. And she and Frederick met when he was a young man, and as they're starting to get closer together, first as friends, and then start to think about maybe a future together, 
Anna was the first person to plant the seed of thought in his mind. You're not meant to be a slave. And as they're starting to fall in love, she said, Frederick, I don't want our children's father to be a slave. History is important for a lot of reasons. I like to think history is most important because we need to know where we've come from in order to know where we're going. Yes. And we're also making history tonight. We're making history today for what is going to reverberate beyond the walls of this hall and the butterfly effect and how the knowledge that you share with me and hopefully that I'm sharing with you will go beyond the walls of this room. And so think about it. Had Anna not planted that seed of thought in his mind, who knows if he ever would have had the courage to run away from slavery? Had she not sold her feather bed to help finance his escape, who knows if he would have ever had the courage to run away from slavery? Had she not helped to sew the disguise that he wore, who knows if he ever would have escaped successfully from slavery? Had that not happened, we would be a very different country than we are today had there been no Frederick Douglass as the great abolitionist. So the other thing that we always talk to kids about all the time is make, make the moment of every time, all the time you have, because you're making history today. And so Anna joins him in New York, they get married. With the help of the Underground Railroad Network, they make their way to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he would change his name from Frederick Bailey, they would take on the last name Douglas, and they would begin their lives together. He had a, a skill as a ship hawker from his time working as a skilled laborer uh, in Baltimore. So he gets a job when he gets to New Bedford. Now, I've often thought about this. If I was a slave for 20 years, and I finally escaped, and I'm in a free state, though now, you know, talking about the morality, the immorality of slavery versus equality, black people being equal to white people is a whole other discussion and conversation. But being in a free place, being married, have a job, and then they start to have a family together, I probably would have just said, hey, I'm good. Let me just try and exist in this space. But thank goodness he and many others didn't. He looked at that institution of slavery, of legalized slavery, and he figured out, okay, how can we go about dismantling this institution? And so he would attend an anti-slavery meeting that was being held by William Lloyd Garrison, the white abolitionist, and the Garrisonians. And Garrison heard that he had this fugitive slave in the audience. And he asked Frederick, will you just get up, will you just tell the audience your story? Just tell them what it was like to be enslaved. And he, he wrote later that he said, this was my first time speaking in front of the white audience, and I was so nervous that my knees were knocking together, and I, I was shaking from every limb. But what he did was he stood up, and he had a natural gift for communication. This institution going, he's, he's putting together his philosophy, and, and he had learned an industrial education at Hampton. And so he thought, okay, let's do the same thing, because education here sometimes started with the basics. It started with hygiene, teaching them how to tie their shoes, how to brush their teeth. Well, what he taught him most importantly was he taught him a trade, a skill, like how to farm the land, how to be an entrepreneur, how to make dresses. Because he understood that if he could give them a stake in the nation's growing economy, then they can help themselves. Because we're coming out of hundreds of years of oppression and racist ideology, and Booker understood he was a pragmatist, that we're not going to be able to just get them to change their racist ways. So I'm going to show free African Americans how they can change themselves how they can overcome obstacles, develop strength of character, and rise by their own efforts to honorable positions of respect, but most importantly, self-esteem. So Washington was a leader who brought stability in a time of transition from enslavement to freedom, and it may be said that he's the person that bridged the gap between the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil Rights Movement. And so, I've always known that I descended from these great men. You know, people ask me, was there a time where, where your parents just sat you down and they said, okay, Kenny, have a seat. We have something important to tell you. <laughs> that never happened. I've just always known. I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I spent all of my summers at Frederick Douglass' summer beach house, which was built in the Chesapeake Bay by my great-great-grandfather, Charles, who was Frederick and Anna's youngest son. 
Charles had purchased 40 plus acres on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, and he parceled and sold them out, but he kept one parcel for his father to build a home. And he said, okay, Dad, I'm going to build this retirement home for you. Are there any special features that you want? And Frederick said, yes, I want the two. I want it to point in a certain direction, and I also want something at the top called a tower. Because what he wanted to do at the end of his life was he wanted to sit in that tower and look back across the Chesapeake Bay, across the water, because on the other side you could see land. And that land is the eastern shore of Maryland, where he was born into slavery and where he toiled away in chains. Mm -hmm. Frederick also understood that history is important because we need to know where we've come from in order to know where we're headed. And even though he had spent the first 20 years of his life enslaved, he never wanted to forget where he came from. And so in that house, I remember being about five or six years old, and there were photographs everywhere, Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass and other family members, so they were always around. But there was this one larger than life portrait that was at the top of the stairs. And we've seen the pictures of the great abolitionist in fact, he became the most photographed American of the 19th century because he understood at the age of 22, only two years removed from slavery, that this new technology, photography, he could use to help make his arguments for liberation and equality in the same way that he used his speeches and his writings. He understood again that he's trying to shatter that public notion and all of the caricatures, the negative images and caricatures that have been put out there trying to justify treating people of African descent inhumanely. And so he said, I'm going to take these photographs, and when you look at me, you're never going to see or think I'm a happy, amiable, fugitive slave. And when you look at me, you're not going to be able to de deny that I'm a man, somebody worthy of freedom and citizenship. So in those early photographs, during his abolitionist years, he's looking directly in the camera. He's serious, not the white-haired statesman that history gave us, the grandfatherly safe figure, the prophet was looking away from the camera. But the serious agitator abolitionist. But as a five or six year old boy, when I would see those pictures, and in particular this, this one at the top of the stairs, larger than life. And I remember one night, it was dark, and I looked at him and I thought, man, you look mean. And I'm glad I don't know you. And as I would try and sneak past that portrait, Try and tiptoe past it, you know what would happen? His eyes would fall in. <laughs> and by the time I got down to the end of that hallway, I could feel this steely glare burning like fire on the back of my neck. And I always imagined in my five year old little boy imagination this boomy, baritone voice bellowing it down upon my tiny person, and he would say, You will do great things, young man. And it like reverberated off the walls like it was a 19th century abolitionist meeting hall. This is each and every one of you. I had a 10 year old girl say to me one time, she said, Mr. Morris, she was so excited. She, Mr. Morris, Mr. Morris, I researched my family tree and I found that my great, 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 four greats, grandmother, I thought I had a lot of greats. She said she was born into slavery. She taught herself to read and write in secret. She escaped, she ran away, and she became a successful businesswoman and a philanthropist. And so she's just busting from the scenes. And so she said, so Mr. Morris, do you know what all of this means? And before I had a chance to answer, she said, it means I have greatness going through my veins, just like you do. My Lord. I said, you're right. All of us have greatness going through our veins. And we all stand on the shoulders and walk in the shoes of those that came before us. History lives in each of us, but the future, it depends on how we carry that forward. Because we all are the sons and daughters. We're the grandsons and granddaughters. Some of us are the products of slavery. This country is the product of slavery. But this country is also the product of the abolition of slavery. And from Frederick Douglass, we learned that we have a right to be free. And from Booker T. Washington, we learned how to make our way in the world as free citizens. And from Martin Luther King Jr., we learned that as free citizens, we have the same rights as all citizens. When I was growing up, the challenges faced by great men like my ancestors were apparent to me because it just so happens their blood goes through my veins. 
But the fact is, all of us, we live far from the cotton fields today. And we're worried more about LeBron James being traded to the Lakers than we are about the threat of being beaten by our overseers. Mm -hmm. And we live in modern times with the echoes of slavery are hard to hear from where we stand. But if we all listen close enough, we'll hear cries and not echoes from the slaves of today. And if we listen close enough, we'll hear cries and not echoes from all of the young people out there that need hope, need inspiration. They need to hear these stories. They need to hear in their own families how they descend from greatness. And when we listen close enough, that's when change will happen. And I'm going to close here with a quick story. I mentioned I was, I was born in Washington, D.C. And I used to go on field trips to Frederick Douglass' home, not the beach house, but his main home in the Anacostia neighborhood of Washington, D.C. It's now a National Historic Site. It's where he spent the last 17 years of his life. And I love going on field trips to that home because there were a couple rooms that I, I just love to look at. And one of them was the library. And I love going to the library because I could see all of his books, thousands of volumes of books from the ceiling to the floor. And I would think to myself, I never spent one day of his life in the classroom, but that's where he got his education. He read everything that he could get his hands on. But my favorite room was upstairs and down the hallway, and that's his bedroom. And you know how when you go into a museum with artifacts, I don't know, I haven't had a chance to tour this museum yet, but you know how it was happening? Velvet rope blocking off the room so you can't get in and touch anything or sit down on the furniture. Well, from the hallway into this room, into his bedroom, was one of those ropes. And when I was a boy, I always wanted to see what was in that room. So I would stretch my neck over the rope, and when I looked to the left, I could see his bed. And on his bed is his nightshirt. And next to the bed on his chair was his hat that he wore as ambassador to Haiti. And next to the chair on the floor was a pair of his shoes. And when I was little, I always wanted to sneak past that rope to try those shoes on. <laughs> and so when we started our organization in 2007, the first speech I ever gave was in the visitor center at that home. And I was talking to a group of students, and I told the story. And again, this young girl raised her hand, and she said, Mr. Morris, I want to know what it must be like to walk in the shoes of Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. <laughs> She's like, 10. I said, that's a deep question. I had to get introspective with her. <laughs> And so I finished my presentation, and when we were done, the site manager at the home did something that they had never done before, and she said, I've got a great idea. Let's go on a special VIP tour. So there were 25 students and some parents and me, and so we rushed up the hill. It's, the house is on a beautiful hill called Cedar Hill. It look, overlooks all of Washington, D.C. If you sit on the porch, you see the Washington Monument, the Capitol, the White House. And so we rushed up the hill, and the kids ran in the house, I'm knocking the kids over to try to get into the library because I wanted to show them the books. We looked at the books, and then, come on, follow, follow me, let's go upstairs, let's go see the bedroom. So we run down the hallway, and stop, there's that rope that's been staring at me for 40, 40 plus years. And the site manager did something they had never done before. She took down the rope, and she said, come on in. So all of us rushed into the room, and it's not a very big room, so 30 plus people in there, we were really standing together, shoulder to shoulder, and then the photographer was ready to take the group picture, and he started placing people. And he said, you go here, you go here, you go here, and as he's getting closer to me, do you know where he put me? In Frederick Douglass shoes. Right next to the shoes. <laughs> so I'm like this, and I look down, and I said, After all of these years, all I would have to do is just slip off my shoes. Okay. And I could step right into them that nobody would ever know. <laughs> Saying to myself, look at me. <laughs> I'm taking pictures of Frederick Douglass' shoes. Fine. <laughs> but I never did. Mm. No anti <laughs> <laughs> I never tried those shoes on because I knew that they wouldn't fit. Those shoes are too big for any of us to fit into. But what I realized at that moment was that I could take the shoes that I've got. Our young people could take the shoes that they've got, mm -hmm. and we could lead the way to a brighter future.
We can lead the way into a better tomorrow, and each and every one of us can make the difference in the lives of those around us, and just like Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Cesar Chavez, Chavez, Susan B. Anthony, pick your freedom fight of choice, we can go on to affect change. Brian writes in the last paragraph of his introduction, he said, Frederick Douglass wrote that, quote, education means emancipation. It means light and liberty. It means the uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light by which men can only be made free, end quote. And then Brian writes, we're living at a time when we need the glorious light of truth. People who are, uh, people who are willing to stand when others say sit down. We need people committed to equality who will speak when others say be quiet. It can be difficult to know how to face some of these overwhelming challenges. Let the words and life of Frederick Douglass show you the way. Thank you all very much.